Well, good morning, Nick. How are you doing? Good morning, Wrecker. Doing well. Even though I shaved and you told me I looked like an old baby. You look like a 60-year-old baby. And I say that <laughs> well aware that you're in your mid-50s. So <laughs> mid, early, yes. early fifties. Well, wonderful. Hey, you, you always talk about, you want to, you aspire to be a scholar and by your own definition, that means you don't actually read papers, you read books. And when I look at the, your video screen, you know, you have a, a bookshelf full of books and I don't see a single journal issue there. So I figure we talk about books today. What do you think? I think that's, well, you know, and I, I think I mentioned this on a previous podcast. I, I, that's not mine. It was Dick Boland's. He said that scholars read books and researchers read articles, right, in recent years. But the scholars, if you really want to capture something big and important deeply, you can't do it in a journal paper. You have to do it in a book, right? Well, here's the problem. Well, in order to be able to read books, someone has to write them, yeah. you know, and, and no one does that anymore, except for one person who we have on the show today, Jan Mentling. Jan, hi, how are you doing? Hey, hello, guys. Thanks for having me. Oh, that's okay. We talked about you uh, quite a few <laughs> times. Uh, we talked about when we talked about, you know, people from dis different disciplines and so forth. But today uh, we want to bring you on the show because uh, you've written plenty of books. And more importantly, you've written plenty of successful books. You've written textbooks. You've written research books. You've, you know, edited volumes and so forth. Um, and I basically came out saying um, no one's writing books anymore. So soon there will be no scholars because scholars need books to read. And since no one's writing them, you know, this, this whole scholarly endeavor is going to die out. Yeah. And you guys have to help me because one of these days I'm going to write a book. Uh, that's going to be my goal here. I, I plan to do it. And Wrecker, so you have a book, Jaybird. Uh, so for the audience, I, I refer to Jan Mendling as Jaybird because there are too many Jans in my life. There's Jan Wrecker, Jan Mendling, then there's uh, Jan van Broek, right, at, uh, at Liechtenstein. And then uh, I actually have a friend I, I co-teach a class with who's Jan. And I don't know why Jan. Right? Jan is the German John, right? Same name. Yeah. So, Nick, can you explain to me? I, I, I always wondered, how did you come up with this idea of calling me Jaybird? What does it, <laughs> which kind of picture does that create in your mind? I, it's because you're kind of cool, right? You've got the hoodie. <laughs> kind of cool. You've got kind of a chill attitude. Uh, you look like that celebrity. Who's the celebrity you look like? Uh, the one. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. What was we his talked name? about that. Mm. Right, I'll, I'll remember the celebrity. I'll look for it. Yeah, yeah. But uh, and I I just think you're way cooler than most academics. So I figure you need a cool name to go with that. <laughs> for some <laughs> reason, when we had a couple of drinks, I, it was Jaybird. Uh, but yeah, and and I think the nice thing and Jaybird Wrecker is the Einstein chair. Yeah. Now I realize you're the nucleus chair or something like that. It's a very that's nice completely chair. lame oh, in comparison, on. isn't it? Yeah. Like <laughs> name one chair we have better than the Einstein there, chair. There's only two, I think. There's the Heisenberg chair, and there is this uh, chair at uh, what is it? MIT. Uh, the uh, oh, geez, the, the the physics chair. Where then in, in is it in Oxford or Cambridge where you have the Newton chair? Yeah, that's the one, the Newton chair. That's probably almost as good as the Einstein chair. Yeah. Well, uh, there's there's an important difference here because uh, the Newton chair is really the chair that Newton had. So, yeah. and of course, I'm not a physicist. Uh, I'm I don't have the chair that Einstein had. Um, it's simply uh, referring to the fact that the funding for my chair is provided by the Einstein Foundation Berlin, um, which is actually a smart thing um, um, because the city of Berlin um, had the plan. Uh, to bid for the Olympics and uh, the citizens turned it down and there was really? already 100 million uh, of euros parked um, and they decided to invest that in research. Hmm. Yeah, so and actually that, that was um, the point where this foundation was created and it, um, it uh, contributes uh, to, uh, to founding um, people, getting people to Berlin uh, for doing research. Mm. Hey, you can get me to Berlin. Just bring me there with your chair, buddy, and I'll, I'll hang out yeah. with you, David, in Berlin. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, oh, it's we wanted, Bradley we Cooper. To... Bradley Cooper is the one who I think, Jay Bird, I knew it would come to me. Do you see the resemblance? No, I don't. Absolutely not. Come on. He did <laughs> ruggedly handsome. <laughs> right, yeah. I'll give you that one. But, Nick, you said, you know, you said you're, at some sense you want to write a book. And why? Why would you do that? It's a lot of work. It's not appreciated. You don't make money with it either. So why, why bother? 
Well, I'll tell you, that's why I haven't written one yet, because you get no academic, uh, I guess, bonus points for it. And, uh, you know, it doesn't help with your network, right? It doesn't help you work with uh, the things that I love to do, which is work with junior people and that type of thing. It's more of a lonely enterprise. Uh, and, you know, if I did that, it would crowd out the research papers. And right now, I mean, the reason Notre Dame hired me is to write journal articles, not to write books, right? And if they're fine with me writing a book, but that's not why uh, I do, you know, that's not why I'm here, you know? Yeah, can I comment on this a little bit? And uh, I think this is, uh, well, uh, I think this is somehow a problem. Uh, so uh, um, there was some incident that actually made me think about how is IS uh, actually doing in terms of writing textbook? Because uh, uh, if you try to find an IS textbook, uh, you will find, for instance, the Lorden book. And um, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and um, uh, Lauden has passed away now. So, and there's a little bit of a question who's taking over this. Yeah? So, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, if uh, I did some statistics and looked at, um, how is it actually with the IS, um, uh, AIS fellows? Uh, and if you look at the AIS fellows, um, you find a larger number of these persons uh, who have never written any textbook at all. Uh, some did, um, and some did actually uh, quite intensively invest their time in, uh, in writing books, but many not at all. And um, for a discipline, um, I think this is kind of uh, kind of a danger. You know? So when you look at uh, how much um, cohesion you get in other disciplines, where um, just like everybody knows, like economics, there's the Samuelson book, for instance, uh, or. Mm. Uh, other disciplines where it's like the textbook, um, yeah. uh, which is really like an anchor for the whole discipline. Um, yeah. Well, we need to develop this more, I think. Well, so there's a problem with that. I understand what you're saying, but one, so first of all, I think textbooks, you're absolutely right. We need them. And we actually have a lot of database management textbooks. Uh, you know, Rick Watson had one, I don't know there that I taught from, but there are a bunch of others. Uh, so I think we had vibrant textbooks at one point, but there's no one textbook, I guess, which is the first thing. The second thing is we don't have a singular field in the sense that, you know, in the old days we did, information systems was what the IT group did in your organization. Now, we still teach those classes a little bit. But for example, when I was at Georgia, I taught from your book with, with Dumas, right, on the, mm. the BPMN stuff or the BPM stuff. And it's like that was an IS class. Yeah. So teaching BPM. And, uh, and I think what happens is we, and right now I don't even teach from a textbook. I teach uh, strategic technologies and I just do Harvard Business Review articles and that sort of thing. I think because we're such a, a diffused and, and you know, there's not this core to the, to the uh, field in the same sense, especially with their teaching. I mean, a lot of our people are teaching entrepreneurship and stuff like this, right? That is true, but that only holds for texts, right? So we don't have textbooks for teaching, maybe because we don't really have a core anymore. Maybe that's true. But what about research textbooks, like method textbooks? Surely there's an, a need for a method textbook. For example, um, uh, there's, there's textbooks like the Shadish, uh, Cook and Campbell for, for experiments, I suppose. I can't even yeah. give you one for survey research. There's no one textbook on survey research. Uh, yeah, well, you do scale development. You use the Develis. And then for uh, the stats, the best is the Hair at All book, H-A-I-R. So. Yeah, fair enough, right? But, you know, by and large, we, we, we don't have a lot of books. And I, I agree with Jan, that's a, it's a huge danger. Um, also because some things can better be said in a book. Like, for example, a, a research methods. You know, it's really hard to write a research methods article and confine something that you want to say about an entire set of procedures, uh, study design, and all these sorts of things on what, like 20, 30 pages. You need a book for yeah. that, right? And the problem there, I agree with Nick, is the incentives are so low, so low. No yeah. one cares. You know, your dean's not going to give you the time you know, mm -hmm. to do it. Even if you did, it won't show up in your yearly rankings, <laughs> you know? Oh, yeah. uh, so it, it doesn't, it literally doesn't help you with promotion and tenure. Or do you know one case where someone got granted a promotion or tenure because they've written a book? I've never heard of that. No, it has to be a labor of love. You have to want to do it and then you do it, right? And so why did you do, so for example, I brought up the BPM book, Business Process Management, mm -hmm. the one with Dumas, I don't know who else, uh, uh, is, is yes, with you it's on Marlon that. Dumas, Marcello La Rosa, and Hayo Reyes. Yeah. And, and, and you, yeah. 
and and it's as far as I'm concerned, I mean, I used it and I think I used the first three chapters from that book, right? BPMN and just setting up the stage and all of that. It was great for practitioners getting into it. It was great for students. What happened? How did this get going? You didn't start this. It was Dumas. He put the group together and said, let's write a textbook or, or what? Or It's not even a textbook. It's more of just like a book on the topic. Yeah, right. So, um, so this whole thing started um, around 2010 when I was um, teaching more BPM related classes. Mm. Um, and I had more autonomy uh, at the level of a junior professor here in Germany um, to design my own classes. Uh, and I felt that um, there wasn't like the full picture in any of the books uh, that I had available. Yeah, so uh, I felt there was a need for, the, for such a book. Uh, and I uh, discussed this more deeply with Hayo. And uh, at a certain time, we discovered uh, that, uh, that Marlon and Marcello were discussing the same thing in parallel mm. uh, without us knowing. And um, we came into a discussion and um, I think we we're all very glad that we decided to do this together uh, because that actually allowed us to, to approach this topic from a much more holistic perspective. Yeah, so. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think what um, the book in the end did is um, it kind of created a, a larger picture, a, a map for the field. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I think in the end, it was, uh, it was very helpful for uh, developing this community further. And, um, um, and with a textbook, you get much better cohesion of the topics. Um, as for instance, uh, as I also see sometimes in IS, uh, that for certain topics, uh, people uh, come together uh, and have edited books, yeah, which mm -hmm. I think is, yeah. um, is, is good for a certain topic, um, but you do not get things so yeah. deeply integrated as if you yeah. have it really like uh, there's an author team uh, writing the whole book from start to end. Yeah. How long did it take you, Jan, that first edition? A year? Yeah, that first edition... Hmm, um, I don't have any records of this. Uh, I think it must have been one and a half year, more or less. Um, I can give you some more precise numbers um, of, um, of, the of the first edition of the German uh, Wirtschaftsinformatik book uh, when I was uh, joining uh, the author's team. Uh, they have really, really precise numbers. Uh, I, can, I could tell you. Um, so that's another one. Where should I send from it? Like yeah, he wrote I've an introductory textbook uh, for for information systems, like like the uh, an equivalent of Loudon and Loudon for for Germany. Yeah, basically. Is that what yeah, that is? Correct. Uh, so that um, yeah. actually that book is a little bit of a different story because I joined uh, the co-authors team. Um, that book originates uh, from um, 1977, uh, yeah. so not far away from my uh, year of birth, uh, where Hans Robert Hansen. Um, started this book uh, and wrote the first edition. Um, at some stage later, um, his um, PhD, former PhD student, then also Professor Gustav Neumann, uh, joined him. Who was your supervisor, right? Who was my supervisor? Yeah. So yeah. it's actually it's uh, three generations um, uh, of uh, Wirtschaftsinformatik researchers um, contributing to this book. So it means I joined the twelfth edition of that book and. Um, uh, by that time, um, this material had grown so large uh, that, um, let's say, much of my job was actually to trim it down and to reorganize it. Yeah. Um, and uh, we ended up with a 600 pages book. Um, and that was, um, yeah, that was a major step. What is Wirtschafts Informatic, right? I know that as an uh, uh, American, right, we the world revolves around the United States. And sometimes these other countries don't realize this, like Germany, they don't realize the world revolves around the US and they think they can write textbooks in their own language, right? So, so uh, what, what is it? So first of all, uh, Lauden and Lauden, that classic that you have, that's also very popular in German. And there's also a German translation of that. Yeah, okay. so that's Lauda and Lauda and Schroeder, I think. So they so also what's the difference between this. that information well, systems? And keep in yeah. mind that in Germany in the 70s or even earlier than that, Wirtschaftsinformatik was already a field that it was being established. And we talked about this. It was kind of coming out of applied software engineering. Yeah, applied informatics um, was called Wirtschaftsinformatik. It was informatics, software engineering for business purposes. And it goes back to the 50s, really, if I remember correctly. Um, right? So the German journal, the Wirtschaftsinformatik, 
um, technically speaking, goes back to the 1959 or something. Anyway, so there's always this field. Mm -hmm. um, and at some stage, it sort of morphed or merged rather to what you would consider information systems. And yeah. now it, it depends. Most people would sort of equate these two things. There's still some that say it's a completely different thing. German virtual informatics is something very different from international information systems. Uh, to people like me, it doesn't really matter. It's just in two names. Um, and it's software development. Right. I give you three examples. So, um, um, Point number one, um, so one topic that has always been much, much stronger, much more prominent is this whole modeling and design topic. Yeah, so uh, that has always been there. Um, later, it was joined um, by uh, topics on uh, particular relating to uh, enterprise resource planning systems mm -hmm. uh, for the prominence of SAP uh, in the German speaking countries. Uh, this yeah. has been a huge topic and uh, I do yeah. not see that so deeply covered uh, in, in the US um, in US journals. And then you have indeed, as you say, uh, uh, a stronger orientation of really um, supporting, facilitating uh, the design process, which leaps uh, deeper into software engineering topics than, um, let's say, the business school type of IS research does. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, the uh, is, when I think of modeling, right? There's your paper that you have. Uh, I guess it's forthcoming in MISQ, and I know a it lot of records. A lot of records early work was so that that totally dovetails with the BPM stuff that you do, and I. I <clears throat> excuse me the other side the enterprises the link like shears work mm -hmm. and eris and all that stuff that came out of workshop workshop work so i think of it as this way right and I, I sometimes get these these articles uh a lot of what it involves is is proposing a new notation like the enterprise system stuff wasn't there a lot of enterprise architecture stuff and people were coming up with new schemes for showing your enterprise architecture. And then there was this like battle of a thousand frameworks around enterprise architecture. Well, I think that's was, not necessarily yeah. a German thing per se, but in Europe, there is a, an old traditional tradition in information systems engineering. Let's call it that, mm -hmm. right? They have their own conference. Um, and that's a largely European community. And they've been very interested in, in modeling, but also in enterprise architecture and enterprise architecture management type of topic. And it goes back to some, uh, some uh, locations that are very world famous. If you think about St. Gallen, um, the business model, business model canvas, that's, a, that's one way of enterprise modeling. So that's a, an example of this uh, enterprise architecture tools as well. So these, these are all topics that have just a long tradition in Europe, just like business process management, by the way. That yeah. never really got into the US. My personal view is because firms just don't really operate in this particular way and business don't really operate in a, in a processual sense or in a relational sense in the US. Mm -hmm. Not sure, but it, you know, it was always a topic that came, was very strong and prevalent in Europe, not, not necessarily only in Germany. There's a very strong uh, uh, a Dutch influence as well with Will and others, Ohio. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, so there are just some traditions and some topics that are sort of prominent here and not so much in the US and vice versa. And a lot of it is how people interact with representations, in a sense, and how they might construct representations to more effectively do things, right? And but like many other things, uh, before, before we maybe move on, I think all these boundaries are blurring. So, you know, German information systems, digital informatics guys, they're not all about modeling. I haven't seen a new notation in years, okay. <laughs> for one thing. Um, if you look up, if you look up, uh, I just recently saw statistics for authorship and the country of authorship for an MIS quarterly. In, uh, Germany has been for a couple of years now number three behind US and China, ahead of hmm. Canada and other places. So uh, uh, German IS scholars, they do all sorts of things. Yeah, and I think a lot of people, they, they don't want to come uh, us talk about that Germans do notations and only design science and stuff. There is a strong tradition in that, but there's also lots of other things. Yeah, lots of yeah. great other work in econometrics, in qualitative stuff, whatever you have. So, so I want to get into the German. Oh, go ahead. But then I want to ask you guys a question. If you, if you ask about the, the German widgets informatics, oh, one thing I think uh, is really striking is that, uh, well, it's not just me, uh, Hans and Neumann. Uh, but also like uh, all kinds of other author teams, uh, they have their uh, introductory book to, to Wirtschafts Informatics. So um, mm -hmm. there are five or six that you can choose from. And um, 
I wonder how that does relate maybe to the number of students. So if, if you look at, let's say, at the stronger uh, places in the German speaking countries, uh, you have an introductory course to something like virtual informatic information systems uh, with several hundred students. Uh, so that means, um, uh, first of all, that puts you under some pressure that you really structure your content well. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you do that, um, well, why don't you just write it down in a little bit more of a structured way and, and have it published? Yeah? Yeah. So um, how does it relate to the student numbers that you guys have uh, with such comparable courses in the U.S.? Well, I mean, in the U.S., it depends which place you go. When I was at the University of Georgia, we had 300 students in a intro class, right? So, so yeah, that was there. The Here at Notre Dame, we have smaller classes, right? So uh, we don't have any 300 student classes that I know of in the business school. Uh, they might be there, but I just don't know of any. You know, I think mm -hmm. the hugest classes are going to be 100 or so students. So, but yeah, we have large scale classes. And the thing is that, you know, people, so at, at Georgia, we had a big uh, information systems identity in the sense that there's an MIS department, a history of MIS. It, it came, it, University of Georgia started their MIS program in like 1968. It was one of the very first programs. So there was a strong identity there. And a lot of these classes, you know, had very traditional. Here at Notre Dame, it's different. We never had an IS department until about the year before I came here. It was just the IS researchers were part of management and, uh, and they split off this IT analytics and operations department. And a lot of what we've been doing since 2017 or 2018 is around analytics. So we've become, mm -hmm. in a lot of ways, the teaching part is less traditional information systems. We have those classes. I teach them. But the identity is a lot more around uh, you know, data, data analytics, data science. But, but I wanted to ask, before we get into, uh, I, I wanted to ask a little bit about the German tradition and how we can integrate it with IS. But before we get into that, I do want to write a book. And you are both authors of books. And I imagine we have listeners that are like, I would want to write a book. What are the pros and cons? Both of you have to answer this. Pros and cons of writing a book and then advice you would give. What do you wish you would have done better? Or what advice could you, would you have liked to have gone back and given yourself? Maybe I go first. And uh, maybe then you can, uh, Jan can comment on this because uh, there's an interesting difference. Uh, I have been writing textbooks in the author teams. And uh, Jan is kind of the guy who likes to do things alone. Um, <laughs> uh, and uh, I think there's some difference. So um, uh, if I look at this, um, I mentioned this uh, 12th edition of this German textbook. Um, it's a, really a substantial um, effort in just writing the book, coordinating uh, with your co-authors, uh, and then doing uh, all the quality assurance uh, that is required to make an action. So um, uh, I picked out some numbers just to illustrate this. Uh, so it, it was more like, um, it, was, it was roughly half a year that is, was really intensively writing uh, on the different parts. Um, just to get the manuscript ready, uh, I had 600 emails of coordination with my oh, co-authors. When you say half a year, is that this is the only thing you worked on. You didn't work on other papers. You didn't work on other projects. You worked on this project. Yeah, that, that's difficult to say. There's always something else um, yeah. that's for certain, uh, but it, uh, it requires a substantial amount of time over a longer period. Mm -hmm. um, then we, we swapped uh, the chapters, uh, did proofreadings and corrections and alignments, um, uh, which I had here something like another 250 emails of proofreading coordination. And uh, then once everything was delivered to the publisher, uh, also that required uh, some, uh, some major interactions uh, because not everything was uh, as it was supposed to be. Uh, and uh, also there we had uh, around 250 emails of coordination. So um, that gives it maybe a little bit of a picture of the magnitude. Of course, I cannot assign num uh, numbers in terms of minutes or hours to this, uh, but uh, uh, it's substantial. Yeah? So there is quite some effort. Um, so on the other hand, um, I always enjoyed um, writing this book and also the other book um, because I felt that I, um, I also can organize things that, are, that I have in my head. Uh, I can see how things actually uh, work together. Um, and I learned a lot through the writing process, um, and I thought this was very valuable for myself. 
Um, I think my classes have very much benefited from the fact that uh, that I have textbooks available that I wrote myself and which give a concise yeah. structure to the classes. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And in the end, that also contributes, let's say, in the long run, also um, towards, uh, let's say, a return on investment in the sense that um, uh, the preparation time for giving uh, a well-organized class uh, is for me very small uh, if it is, let's say, a BPM related topic, for instance. Yeah. Um, some things that are difficult to, um, well, I'd say to count on. Um, so for us, it happened that with this BPM book, uh, that this book turned out to be uh, also very useful for others, as it seems. Uh, so uh, a lot of universities around the globe have picked it up. Uh, we get a lot of citations for this, uh, but. Um, um, it, this is, of course, not guaranteed, uh, and we didn't speculate on this uh, when we when we did this. But uh, if you write a good textbook, um, you have a fairly good chance that this this will be cited, um, that you help the field, and um, that it also um, contributes to your um, to your prestige as a scholar. I think. Hmm. I wanted to make that same point because if you look at your these two textbooks that you refer to, they have thousands of citations. Hmm. Yeah, so I think that is, as you said, it's not guaranteed, but for many people that have a really good book, that is, uh, you know, that's that's a citation color. So it does have some value, some real um, sort of measurable value uh, in the long run, right? So you, I, I don't know the exact numbers, but I think one of your books has 3,000, the other one has 1,000 citations. That's a lot of citations yeah, just for two pieces of work. Um, I wanted to say two things uh, from my end. Um, the reason that I started this, first of all, my, my book is the original is 10 years old and it was a very different time in a different context. Remember Australian European tradition 10 years ago, around 2010, the research method training that we have gotten used to now, also in these regions, wasn't quite like that then. Yeah. So my own training, I literally moved continents to get better training. That was my own individual uh, story just even earlier, but even around 2010, whereas I was working a lot with, uh, doctoral students and sort of emergent scholars, postdocs and so forth, there wasn't a lot of good training available. And there wasn't really a good book that sort of sets a foundation for that in our field. And I felt there was a need for this in this region. Now, in the US, you probably didn't need that book, maybe not. But then again, at that time, you certainly had better training. Now, I think it all even out and a lot of people get really, really good training these days. If I look around here in Germany, what's happening, it's fantastic training now, but that only evolved over 10, 15 years. So back then there wasn't um, and I was always interested in sort of training and methods and many methods, not just one. You know, I sort of am a little bit of a generalist. I do all sorts of things, not all of them good necessarily, but I do lots of them. Anyway, so it was courses that was teaching and at some sense, why don't I write it down? A second factor was then that I was in sabbatical. So I had some time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then I, as Jan said, I wrote them myself. Um, without having to coordinate. So I don't have 600 emails and I actually wrote them in about three months, I would say. And the, the second edition, again, I would say two to three months while doing some other things, but no teaching, for example. Yeah. So literally I was sitting in, in the, uh, the kitchen of who's now my wife, but back then was my, my girlfriend. She was going off to work every day and I was sitting in a kitchen and you know, we wrote the book. Um, and that, that was a sort of a couple of months concerted effort for, for sort of 200 pages. So it like crowded out a paper basically, right? Yeah, it, pretty much. Could yeah. have written a paper. Could have written a paper, um, mm -hmm. but I wrote a book by myself. So I didn't have to coordinate and I do like not having to do that every now and then, to be honest. You have your own voice. You don't really have the same type of review process. So you have a lot of freedom and say things the way that you want it. It's, it's one of the advantages. It's also one of the disadvantages to get good books, uh, reviews for your book is a little bit more difficult to organize. Uh, but, oh, you know, you have lots more freedom. So I can say things yeah. the way that I wanted to. So all of that is very nice. Um, if I had to give one tip, one thing that really... I don't like is the publishers themselves. Hmm. So I'm fairly furious about uh, many of the publishers, uh, is, including the ones that I've chosen. I would never do it again. And one of the reasons I wrote the second edition still came out is because I had a pretty tight contract still with them and basically had to deliver. Wow. And if I could, I would tell people these days, 2021, 
just publish the book yourself. In fact, make it mm. free. You know, just just get it out there. You're not going to make money with this anyway. Not not noticeable money anyway. So just get oh, it out. Jaybird makes money. He's got a mansion he lives in in, in uh, Berlin from book revenue. Well, unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, we we live in the wrong times for this. So um, uh, <laughs> if you look at this Wirtschaftsinformatik book, uh, when Hans Robert Hansen started this, uh, he sold. 10,000 copies per year uh, upwards in the 80s. So uh, this uh, this whole textbook, when it was still only under his auspicious, um, sold half a million copies. Um, uh, that's incredible. Uh, so mm -hmm. we are so far away from this. Um, yeah. So I, I can I can go on a good diner or a cheap holiday from the money that <laughs> comes in from this, but. Um, it doesn't justify the effort. Yeah. So if, if you really want to earn, let's say, uh, 2,000 euros of money, uh, you better do some consulting with a company and not mm -hmm. write a textbook. Yeah. 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 And that's, yeah. So uh, there, there was nothing else that, that I want to bring up. So uh, with this personal perspective, I think that's just one, one side to it. And um, there's also, of course, the community side to it. Yeah? So what would a community wish for? And um, um, uh, and that's a little bit, of course, related to the personal perspectives, uh, but um, a community benefits from the fact that there are strong textbooks. And um, um, for the fact that uh, in IS, there are not so many textbooks that are really, uh, say, uh, content oriented. So, uh, well, Jan's book, for instance, I would call more method oriented. Yeah. Um, so, and, uh, but you also see some examples of, uh, of people who have been pushing their topics also by actually writing textbooks. So if you look at um, Mary Lassity and Wilcox, uh, they've been writing a lot of books on uh, IT outsourcing, for instance. Mm -hmm. uh, they've also written excellent articles on this uh, topic. And um, that, has, that is part of how this topic actually has developed. Mm. Uh, so as a field, uh, we should actually encourage this. And um, yeah. uh, I believe the community benefits from the fact that there are large, uh, large textbooks available uh, that kind of uh, provide an anchor for many of the topics, which are usually more separated uh, in, in a more niche and esoteric discourse. But there again, we're, we're asking people to kind of go against their own self-interest, engage in a labor and do so without much reward, right? And, and I think the old days you could make money with the textbook and the paper publication pressures for junior faculty were not what they are now. <clears throat> so you know, again, I'll bring up Rick Watson and his database book. I think he did quite well with his database book for decades, you know, and then uh, I think that more recently, these database books are probably not being used. Why would you use a textbook when everything is that? And then I want to bring up something else that Wrecker mentioned, which is these publishers. Then I'll give you my own experience with, or this is what I wanted to do. And this was back when I was at Georgia. I really got annoyed with this whole publication uh, thing where, you give the publisher free labor of reviews. So I'm on the editorial board of information and organization, right? And that's an emerald uh, and, and that's the publisher. So you are giving them free work in terms of reviews. Then you're giving them content, a paper that they will then publish and then sell back to you. So they pay you nothing for your labor and then sell back to you your research to your university at exorbitant rates. So I'm thinking, I just won't be part of this. Not that I'm not some communist that, that uh, you know, doesn't believe in capitalism. I totally believe in capitalism, but I believe capitalism is exchanging value for value, right? Where, where you have to provide someone something of value. And here we have a publishing game that's totally left from the industrial age. It's like yep, they, it is. They, they bound the book for you and maybe did some editing work. We don't need that anymore. Right. So, so it's, it's a matter of time before these, these, but there's this institution, there's this history that makes us work with these journals. And I was, I had made the decision. I'm not going to do reviews or editorial work or write papers for these companies anymore. That lasted about a month. And then one of our uh, PhD students had a paper we're working on. He wanted to send it. The journal that we sent it to was, I forget which publisher, but it was a publisher. It was the appropriate journal. And it's like, all right, I'm not going to hurt this guy's career. So we actually ended up publishing it in that, in that journal and, and whatever. And then it's like, all right, well, if it were just me, I could manage my career that way. If I'm going to work with students, I really need to 
to to give them the entire breadth of the field and let them do that, which means that I'm right back in like every other academic selling my soul to these silly publishers, right? So, so I think like, uh, the story is a little bit clearer for uh, journals and uh, articles, I believe. So uh, um, usually for, if you come, let's say with a textbook idea that is narrow, um, you're happy that they publish it. Uh, but if you kind of approach, uh, approach like a larger topic, um, um, you will get some royalties for that. Uh, so that is, first of all, a difference. So you can then determine if that is enough or fair. That's another question, uh, but uh, uh, you don't, uh, you don't, it's not free labor as such. Uh, yeah. So and when I uh, also look at the, um, at the German textbook, um, our publishers did uh, quite a diligent uh, editing process and uh, uh, actually uh, created all of uh, the figures in a consistent way. Um, that was also some labor that they brought to the table. Yeah. Hmm. Um, still, um, uh, I understand a bit what Jan is saying. And uh, also when you look at some of the um, recent machine learning books uh, that are available just like for free as a PDF on the internet, uh, that are extremely successful and uh, people read it. So for, just for, if it is for disseminating ideas, um, um, self-publishing uh, can also be a good idea. Mm -hmm. So well, we could talk a little bit more about this um, because my, my view on this is, is like Nick, my experience in just, just forget about journal publishing, just book publishing is that I get very little value for the money. And I also get very little share given what I, what I put in. So you mentioned in German textbooks, you get editing. Well, if you write an English book, they don't. Um, you create all the book. I, I I had to pay my own language editor. I had to organize reviews. You know this because you reviewed parts of the book, which I organized myself because they wouldn't do it. Um, you know, I had to write all this. I had to recreate all the figures and all these sorts of things. Uh, um, and they created the PDF. That's it. And that, all, mm -hmm. that too was outsourced. Yeah. Um, and, and then if you also look at some of the sort of terms and clauses of such a contract, what you get out of it is not only ridiculously unfair, but it's also very intransparent. Yeah, for example, uh, you usually have a contract that stipulates for every copy that you sell, you get some sort of fraction. Um, and then there's some sort of uh, fraction that you get for online you know, downloads of your book. But for some reason, they can't really know how much that is. And I'm sitting there thinking like, it's, it's ridiculous. You know exactly how many chapters and how many versions of the book, etc. How you know exactly how much of that is accessed. You just don't want to tell me. Instead, you give me some sort of bulk, bulk ratio figure thing that's yeah. to my disadvantage very clearly. So it's, you know, it's really hard to get to the bottom of this. And if you try to get some actual numbers from them, really difficult. So I'm, I'm, I'm not happy. No. Over time, they'll get disrupted. The question is, in the meantime, they are engaging in these, these sorry practices. So right now, and, and you guys should tell me what I should do. Uh, Stefan and I wrote a book chapter for a book. I think it's a, a Sage, Sage or Springer, one of those two. It's one of these collected volumes, right? Yeah. We, it's a nice chapter. We're very proud of it. So I was actually are going to pay to get it open access. So you don't have to buy the $150 book. You could just get download our PDF for free. So I was yeah. going to pay for that. And the publisher has a thing in the chat. I submitted our form like a week late. So they're like, no, we have this complicated mathematical routine where we figure out costs and we cannot make yours open access anymore. That's what they told me. So what do you think? Is that unethical to just withdraw my book chapter then? And then they have a choice. Either they take my cash, keep it in the book, or I just send the chapter off to a journal or something. And then at least it's online. You can download the PDF. I, I don't like this idea of, of, of nonsense that a week later, all of a sudden now everything has changed because I missed some arbitrary deadline. You can look at the, at the terms and um usually it's okay to put like a preprint on a, on research gate or somewhere else and then people can read it i'm more radical i um i'm uh, there's there's an ongoing war and sort of pressure is mounting on the on the publishing you know publishing is one of the highest margin industries in the world if you look at what elsevier is making through journal publishing etc and so forth so i care very little about the terms. So all my papers are on ResearchGate until someone bothers to force me to take them down. 
I'm serious. Um, so that's what I did, and now I'm kicked off a of research gate, though. Well, you know, so so be it. <laughs> they're, phag- they're, they're staging the war, but it's a war they're eventually going to lose because everyone, the, you know, there's growing transparency about what type of business this is. Um, so I am fight like I'm not really a strong fighter here because I still publish with them and so forth, right? As you said, you could also choose not to engage with it whatsoever. But what it does mean is, in your case, if you really you want to take a stand, I'll take it. Say like, well, I'm not gonna publish with you under these conditions. I'll rather take it elsewhere. Thank you very much. Yeah. You know, so that's that's what I would do. Um, and so that's what like every paper that I publish, whether it's open access or not, every, someone wants a copy, I'll be more than happy to share it. Well, I've course, been giving yeah. away my book for free to people I wanted. I don't because I'm not making money with this. Why should you bring them? I don't care. Yeah. yeah so uh, anyone want the book, send me an email. I'll, I'll give it to you. <laughs> <laughs> hey, do I get a book or do I already have it? I think I already have a PDF of it. Yeah. You should have received a copy in the mail, to be honest. Oh, I didn't get one of those. Is it autographed? No. I have to. No, of course not. <laughs> All right. So, hey, Jaybird gave me a copy of Worshap's Informatique. It's at my office and he signed it with a nice note because he cares about me. Now, I can't read a damn thing in the book, but, you know, I could Google Translate <laughs> if I wanted to. Uh, All right. So, guys, I want to shift gears a little bit here from, yeah. from books, which basically neither of you have convinced me to sell, to write a book. But if I do... It sounds like I want to do some sort of uh, open access sort of self-published type thing. Just put the PDFs online. <clears throat> uh, but I want to switch a little bit to something and I'll, I'll tell you what I'm dealing with. You know, Academy of Management is the world's biggest conference for management professors, right? So, so they literally have everything there. Everybody in a business school, you, you have somewhere to go. Uh, in, in the Academy of Management. And that's everything from operations to sustainability to, you know, there's, there's philosophy and cre- there, there's every single group you can imagine. And we have a group there that's kind of IS focused. It used to be called OSIS, uh, Organizational Communications and Information Systems. It's now called uh, Communications and Digital Technologies and Organizations. So it's CTO. And I am on this rotation now for a four-year or five-year leadership for this CTO group. And I just started. So I'm doing doctoral consortium and, uh, and professional development workshops. This is what I would like to do during my time there. I think technical people, computer scientists, as, as Wrecker knows, and I say this all the time, the last decade for information systems was the decade of the economists. The next decade, I think, is the kind of computer scientist, statistician, kind of analytics side of the field. I think it's pattern matching. I think it's machine learning. I think we're bringing that to the business disciplines. I think that's a lot of what the next decade. Of course, we'll still do qualitative and experiments and all the things we do. But, but I think that's a big part of where information systems is going. So I want to give these people who do design science, who do algorithmic research, who do all this kind of stuff that jaybird you do uh how do i get them like maybe germans maybe anyone how do i get design science and because they don't feel like they have a home there i don't imagine uh how do, how do i get them to show up at cto and, and at academy of management is there is there an angle difficult question yeah so but uh, i think uh, you raised already the key point so it's uh, first of all it's different communities if you look at it in a strict way yeah, so and uh, communities have their their habits, um, their um, uh, their specific types of rewards and honors, and um, so if uh, if a person who appreciates ACM conferences, uh, um, I don't see directly why that person would see a benefit in, uh, in showing up and educating the business people uh, about their research. Uh, so it, it has to create um, some incentives for them. I think that is a good idea to think of. And I think it, it might actually spark some collaborations to explicitly reach out to those people who are already the uh, boundary spanners, um, to reach out to people who might uh, be happy to come as an invited keynote, for instance, mm-hmm. um, to get um, to start this conversation. Yeah, so, and um, I think once this conversation is rolling, uh, that can be uh, self-perpetuating. Um, but uh, I see it really as a, as a challenge. Um, and um, on the other hand, I also see the benefits of this um, to uh, make these people talk with each other. 
Jan, Jan, you're, you're a guy um, who is, has been jumping between the fields, right? So you've uh, been in IS and you've published in, in, you know, sort of mainstream IS, but you're also strong with ACM and IEEE. You publish in all their top journals too, for example, and you go to their conferences as well. So I fully agree with what you said is like these communities, they have their core, they have their uh, traditions, they have their norms and values. Um, maybe you can talk a little bit. So, so I think like in order to bridge that, we first have to understand what they are. Yeah. So if you compare what you know about information system to what you know about, let's say, computer science, formal computer science, and what you also do, what are some of the norms and the values and the traditions that you see that, were, that might be different? I don't know, in how the conference run, in um, what they value in papers, how the journals are organized, anything really. Uh, so first of all... Um... Conferences are much more prominent um, and the proceedings that are generated out of these conferences. So uh, um, that means um, in certain areas, um, you would not care too much about the journals. Yeah? So um, if somebody um, who's doing AI, who has, a, has the chance to get a paper published at, uh, at Ichkai, um, yeah, sure, they'll do it. Uh, if you have a, a VLDB paper as a database person, um, this is something that uh, you would celebrate about. Yeah? So um, these conferences uh, are much stronger and it means also um, that um, uh, in a way uh, the cycles of getting knowledge out uh, are shorter because you are in these annual um, conference reviewing cycles. Um, some of the conferences have even broken that up uh, into several um, review rounds uh, for the same conference, like VLDB mm. does, for instance. Uh, so, um, and um, then that means um, it's much more about um, developing uh, quickly uh, fundamental ideas and trying them out uh, and getting them published in the conferences. And um, usually then uh, it does not really go so often um, into, let's say, longer rounds of evaluation, et cetera, into the journals. Uh, but also the standards for these conferences are extremely high. So um, yeah. when I look at some of the recent VLDB papers, how much effort uh, are actually in those papers? Um, so there's much work going into the submission. Um, and if that is visible, then actually then the review cycles are shorter. Um, and that's a little bit uh, maybe different to some of uh, the journal cycles that we have where the effort continues after things are being submitted and revised and so forth. Yeah. So this is in the US, if you're in a computer science department, what you're describing is, is what happens, right? They, they value conferences, journals are fine and there are a lot of nice journals and they'll send stuff there, but they're, they get their tenure on conferences and on grants, right? They get funding from either uh, national, like the National Science Foundation or from corporations. And then if you get enough grants, you get some of these conference, you can be f full professor and tenured and all of that sort of thing. The problem is that a lot of these computer science-y analytics stat statistics, like in my own department, we have pure, we have one of the best statisticians at the University of Notre Dame, right, in our business school department. And the dean and, and we understand, and, and, you know, we have computer scientists, we have statisticians. We understand that, uh, you know, they're doing great things in their field, but our dean and other business school deans, <clears throat> they want to see business publications. Uh, so in the game is different. They don't need, if you're in a business school in the U S you don't need to go get your funding. You know, we, we like funding. If you go get it, that's fine. Uh, if you get these conference hits, that's fine. But but, you know, it, it, uh, the currency of the realm in business schools is management publications. And, and I think that there's a small segment of people, at least in the U.S., it's not that huge, but it's these analytics folks that are in business schools. And, and I think maybe those are the ones that I would target and try and get them. Is there an equivalent in Germany where it's the same thing? Like it's, 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 it's very similar to what you described. Also, if you go into the informatics department, they would operate exactly the same way, what you just described and what you described. I wanted to add one more thing, what you said about the deans. It also manifests, for example, in hiring uh, decisions. I was in a hiring committee here uh, where you try, which was sort of interdisciplinary, something like an IS person. You have people from the informatics department and from the business school there, and they're fighting. And they're fighting uh, 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 
over candidates, one of which is more informatics and has, uh, you know, some top AI conference paper that the business school people don't feel are equivalent to a journal of marketing paper. You know, and, and, and so in both of these parties literally fight over this, the same over the relevance of third party funding. So there could be literally one candidate that has never submitted a grant proposal and the other guy has 7 million, you know, to their name. Um, and so it's, it's not helping either one because it, it leads to a lot of division um, between these departments, which is difficult to begin with. And you, you really have to make a choice because if you get that informatics person with 7 million and a bunch of conference papers into the business school, and then two years later, they ask him, where's your FT50 journal or your UT Dallas journal? You know, right. that's not going to happen. Um, so uh, that that is a real problem, I think, at the moment. And the analytics people, I don't think the boundary spenders, I think they are the ones that are literally caught in that because it depends yeah. a little bit on which institution are being brought up, whether you're yeah. more for journals or more for conferences, more for grants or less for grants, and then where you're applying. And if you happen to be on the wrong side of this, then you come out of that tradition, but you have a job offer there and, you know, and, and then it won't work. So I think there are, we see this a lot with analytics and computational folks. Um, and it's difficult for, uh, more difficult for them to get a position than it should be, I think. Mm -hmm. What you also see is a little bit, let's say, um, well, you know this, Nick, uh, ends in view. Yeah. So um Uh, what typically a computer science person is aiming for uh, is coming up with some more powerful technology, right? Uh, and uh, I take technology now broad, so it could be also like formal concepts, for instance. Yeah. Um, while uh, the management-oriented um, researchers um, in the ISP, they would long for better and deeper insights. Yeah. So th that is a completely different mindset um, that is very difficult to bridge. Um, it's interesting. We know this a, bit, a little bit from the BPM field because uh, both of these um, thoughts of uh, school thoughts uh, are uh, in the community and uh, we have been learning it the hard way uh, that uh, we need to establish some common ground uh, to understand what, you, what we are doing um, to speak with each other. Um, but that would be something that uh, maybe is in other fields uh, still a, a journey of conversation that needs to be started. Mm -hmm. So this is one thing that I'm, tell me if you think, so Jaybird, I think I've already asked you to be a doctoral consortium uh, person. If I haven't, I was planning to ask you for this <laughs> academy management. Uh, I think you've been doing that more often uh, using these episodes to, to <laughs> delegate work, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess. But that's what I was going to do is get a few folks, maybe uh, from these traditions to be part of the doctoral uh, consortium so that some doctoral students go and they have a mentor who can speak to them, right? So, so that was my one idea. That, and then the other was, I was going to try and get some folks. Uh, I've been talking a, a, a couple about a professional development workshop on how to publish technical papers in management journals, right? Or something like that. That's a and, nice idea. I like that. Uh, and, and that's my start. That's possible? <laughs> it, it, well, you've done it, dude. Uh, but I think it is. And, and I think in the next decade, there will be a lot more opportunities to do so. And I know ISR is already publishing them. Uh, MISQ would like to. Uh, it depends which editor you get. And I think we're, we're going to see more and more. I see this a lot in other disciplines, like marketing is, is very advanced in, in their uh, machine learning applications, computational analysis through machine learning, you know, text, video, uh, picture, you know, uh, when it mm. comes to social media marketing and influencer marketing and that sort of stuff. Um, there's some pretty uh, advanced papers, computationally advanced papers um, that they're already publishing and they have for yeah. a couple of years. Yeah. And I think we need to do that. We need to figure out what is the thing we can publish. And I don't, I don't know this as an editor of, you know, is that I'm not sure. I, I, I guess I would know it when I see it, <laughs> something that we should, but I don't know what advice to give. So I think there are better people to, to give advice as to, and, and maybe we should have a future episode where we talk about that. But the idea would be, you know, what is the difference? Maybe you guys should tell me, what is the difference between say an approach to machine learning Uh, versus an approach to machine learning that I would publish in a management uh, outlet or an IS outlet, right? Well, I think, I think one of the differences that I see at the moment is that there is research that advances the computational methods. Mm -hmm. Say, I don't know, if you do text analysis through computational tools through BERT, you can make that better. 
either in general purpose models or in domain specific language models you know one way or another you can uh, you know make make that be- make that technology better more powerful to me that's an engineering that would be more in the in the form of the computer science traditions i think in in management if you think of management MISQ, I think Jan said it's about insights. I would always say it's about implicated practices. Mm. So we we take that and apply it to understand something about, let's say, influencer marketing. Yeah, mm-hmm. on uh, on TikTok, whatever. Yeah. So here the focus is more on the implicated practice, and we don't. Nece- I don't think we necessarily look for making the method itself, BERT itself, better. Well, we look to apply to generate novel insights into the implicated practice. So one of them is application oriented in a way, and the other one is, is engineering slash method oriented. Yeah. yeah, I fully agree. Uh, just to sharpen that point a little bit, uh, some of you may know uh, this design science paper uh, from uh, Hefner and Gregor together. Yeah. Um, uh, and I think there's one thing that, uh, that, is, uh, that is a very fruitful distinction that is uh, improvement versus acceptation. And I think uh, when it's really about technology improvement, I think there's hardly space in an IS journal. Uh, but when it comes to acceptation, that means identifying domain grounded problems and taking uh, some interesting technology in that you can do certain things uh, in a nicer way, uh, I think then it becomes interesting. Yeah, it's a good, good way to look at it, I think. Well, this is something we have to deal with. And I think we have to deal with it uh, sooner rather than later. I think we need... Uh, a home for uh, essentially computational folks and in, uh, in our journals and in our meetings. And, and we need more cross-pollination, right? We're in the, the age of AI, we're in the age of big data. And then there's a bunch of people, yes, we can still do qualitative, we can still do surveys, we can do all the methods we've done in the past, but let's make sure we can tap into, you know, sequences, uh, networks, unstructured data and that we can get at these in, in cutting edge ways to, to do interesting things. Right. We need to, we need that. And, well, and, uh, yeah. I think, I think I agree, uh, but also think we're in a pretty healthy state. So number one, we talked about this a lot. It's a fairly pluralistic, diverse field. Let the thousand flowers bloom. Lots of marketplace for ideas and then most of them are welcome. That's number one. So that means there's a, a ground which would appreciate some of these ideas. Secondly, um, it all comes down to individuals as boundary spanners. And there are people like Jan who have been hopping, between, not just between IS and management. We've had people in the past uh, like yourself that, that have done this a lot, but we also have people that hop between the computer science, computational sides, engineering traditions and, and IS as well. Maybe they have, I, I think there's few of them but they're there and they do stuff. And many of them are really, really active. We also talked to um, Will and we talked to uh, Brian earlier, right? Um, so if you look at what some of these individuals are doing, like what you're doing, Jan and others, uh, this is really helping. And a lot of them have quite a reach yeah, to, to other people and that creates momentum and movement. The only thing I would say we could do better is none of this is new cross-pollination of ideas, cross-disciplinary stuff, interdisciplinary things. We've seen this a lot, you know, so it, we, we had BPM had been dealing with the same issue for, for, for decades, but even broader than that, we have fields such as geoinformatics, bioinformatics, health informatics, et cetera. But we never yeah. go to them and ask them what worked for you guys, what we could adopt yeah. and sort of as practices, what, what could we do guys tell us? Cause you've been here earlier. So that's yeah. something like a little bit more of learning, and going to places that maybe have already done a good job rather than us reinventing the wheel all the time. I think that would be helpful. You know what I think we need? If, if only we knew someone at a university, say like Humboldt University that had something like an Einstein chair yeah. that could bring us together. And in, in Berlin, in Berlin, where, where there are nice restaurants, maybe some. There's also the house of a thousand beers in, in Berlin. See, that's where we need to have this meeting. Do they have a meeting room there? Yeah, if only we knew someone. Yeah, absolutely. We have a lot of this, and uh, I look forward to have you guys in person here. After COVID, right? After Germany's COVID. locked down. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah, I think springtime will be already much better. And uh, also for some of the listeners, uh, come over to Berlin. I got my vaccine. Do you guys all have boosters? I've done my vaccine, and then I did my booster now. Are you boosted as well? Uh, with, yeah. I'm only allowed to do it in end of February. Oh. I got my I got my date set. I'll be boosted in January. My wife is being boosted tomorrow. So you know, my, my parents have been boosted yesterday. So we're, it's it's happening. 
Well, we're just, I think we're going to spend this COVID will never go away and we'll just spend the rest of our lives getting boosted and alternating between lockdown and not lockdown. It's the worst thing in the world, you know? Well, this is how your podcast came about, right? <laughs> that's true. Yeah. That's Wrecker true. got lonely. He's like sitting in his room, tearing his hair out going, what's left of it. All right, guys, this was a uh, good fun. Uh, you know, I think we only touched upon everything. I mean, we want to talk about books and I feel like we only scratched the surface and I don't think we did a good job either. So maybe we can just uh, end by, uh, I would like to see more books. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> I don't think we sold it very well to you, Nick. And I don't think we sold it very well to anyone else who is even just sort of like playing with the idea. I think we sold them out for not doing it. Yeah, exactly. So that that's a poor job on our behalf. Um, um, so I, you know, books, books, books are great. I think it's a great creative and intellectual exercise for one thing, just for you, for oneself. And I also think like personally, if I look at my book, like the moment it came out, I want to rip it to pieces and write it new because I don't think it's very good. So Uh, you know, that, that means there's a lot of room. There's a lot of room for, for good books. I'm, I'm serious here on all levels, whether it be content, text, methods, career advice, like Venki's book isn't bad, but it's the only one, you know, uh, there's a nice book by Arnold Bat Batache. It's also nice, but it's the only one, you know? So uh, I think we, we need the, the, to crowd the space a little bit more and people would appreciate it. But here's an argument for self-interest or for getting books. You're right. Uh, Jaybird has thousands of citations across his two books. Uh, his BPM book has almost 3,000. Yeah. Your <clears throat> scientific research and information systems has over 500 citations uh, on Google Scholar. So you get a lot of citations apparently for books, right? So maybe that's one argument for the self-interest Uh this transactional self-interested scholarship. But no, the reason I want to write a book and, and I will do it. I, the thing that you sold me on, Jan, is a uh, wrecker, is I love collaborating. But I kind of feel like I want to do a couple of my own uh, things and I'm not going to do them as journal articles. I, I enjoy doing collaborations for journal articles, but I could see writing a book and, and having it be my own. Uh, and, and it's my voice and it's entirely, and it's not about the research. It's about the idea that the book is pushing. So, so that sold me a little bit. And then I, the other thing I'm taking away from this conversation is I will try to circumvent publishers. And, and one thing we, we could maybe do is find the alternatives to publishers that would distribute and help. And they're out there, right? They're all. Like from the University of Georgia, there's the Global Text Project, which I think was born out of the University of Georgia. And that it was, was Rick a, Watson. Yeah. A, oh, it was him even. Okay. So yeah. they're, they are distributing textbooks, including IS textbooks, entirely for free. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, uh, I think that's the one thing I would do with my books. Uh, or I would go see where Herb Simon published and then just try and publish there because I would want to follow in his footsteps. <laughs> <laughs> So I think in the end, it's, uh, well, that's maybe a romantic argument. Uh, just when you have your printed book in your hands, that's just beautiful. Yeah. So uh, I see now Jan uh, is picking, He's picking, picking his, up his, up his up and holding and it in his touching hand. it and caressing it. And uh, yeah. uh, that, that's, that's a beautiful experience that you, of course, uh, that you will miss when you just put it out as a PDF somewhere. I've actually seen Wrecker take his shirt off and rub his book on his chest. <laughs> he's, he's done that. There's a video of that on TikTok. <laughs> not. All right. All right. This is devolving rapidly and we're not even, uh, uh, it's still morning for me. Okay. Jan, it was, it was so great to have you. I think we'll have you, we'll have to have you back. Um, I want to get deeper into this uh, bridging between information system, computer science. Maybe it's a personal interest of mine, but I, 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 I kind of, I can't name many other people like you that jump so successfully between them. So I want to pick your brain more on this. We only touched upon this today. Thanks for being on the show. Thank you so much. See you guys. Mm -hmm.